Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right, so here's the first question I want to ask. You've been an entrepreneur for most of your career, over 15 years. What was... I had a full head of air when I started. Ah, that <laughs> happens. What was the point in time where you knew this was going to be your, your career path? Um, you know, out of college I had a job uh, selling yellow beige ads. And the guy asked me like the dumbest question. He said, if you're going to be a tree, what kind of tree would you want to be? I said, oh, I'd be an oak tree because it has longevity and it's strong and it's dependable and all this other crap, right? And I thought, if that guy's asking me this, I don't want to work. I left like a week later. And then I was unemployable because I had an English degree and a philosophy minor, which is unemployable. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. And um, so then I started uh, Mercury Web Solutions, which was my first company, and uh, just started to get revenue and make money. And I was like, holy shit, this is pretty cool. All right, give us and it just kept on going. Yeah, give us the pitch from 10 years ago. So what does is, what is Mercury do? Um, it was a digital media firm in like 2000. We did website development, uh, content management systems before... You know, CMS was a sort of an open source, you know, free version. That's how we made a lot of money there. And then um, a lot of email marketing. Google had just come out. I remember I had a, a developer who said, oh, have you heard of Google before? I said, oh, what is it? You know, and he showed it to us. And, and so, yeah, so that was sort of the start. And at that point, I didn't have a business degree or anything like that. So I would work all day. I'd go home. I'd read books. And I'd read, you know, whether it be... Jack Welsh or you know some of these sort of big heads of state and just try to devour this content because every day I was doing shit wrong every day and so I was like okay I got to figure out not yeah. to mess up so much. When you started it sounded like right after school did you have any tech baseline or you were just no. like I'm starting a tech company no. I'm gonna figure this out and fly. I had a customer in revenue and I was like I'm capitalist and let's figure it out. How'd you get that first customer? Um, I probably got him drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Just, you know, just like promise the world, but you know, you have to deliver on it too, okay. right? Um, so, and I'm, I don't have a technical background, so that as a entrepreneur in a software world, that's a tough, that's a tough place to be, and obviously that's why, you know, Tim has joined on. Um, when we built with Echovate, when we started, uh, we used uh, the folks at Spark to build our whole prototype and all that, and that really opened my eyes to, I need somebody who's sort of my counterpart in the business, because I can't manage a technology team if I don't know that sort of business. Okay, so when so. you were at Mercury, how'd you go out and find that first technical talent? <laughs> That's a good question. So my, the first guy, I had just enough money to pay payroll for him, yeah. but I didn't have enough money for an office, so he worked out of my basement. This is this an, embar <laughs> it's an embarrassing story. <laughs> and um, I didn't have enough money for computers, and so he would bring his tower to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a monitor. And then he'd bring his tower to work, and so he'd show up, and we'd go in my basement, and you know, deliver on client stuff, and then he'd leave, and he'd bring his tower to work. Take it with him. It's pretty embarrassing. That is. Incredible. And then we got another client, and we got an office, and then we got equipment and all that good stuff. Yeah. So was this a services business or a product business? Services. Okay. That's a tough business to be in. That's about to say. It's a tough business to be in, and it's an extraordinarily tough business to scale. It's incredible. So how did you how did you go about approaching that? For Mercury specifically? Um, you know, we just set out to, we really just set out to be the best web development digital media shop in the area. Mm -hmm. And again, reading all these books, we tried to systematize everything we could. We tried to look and say, where's our most profitable customer? What does that sort of buyer persona look like? Mm -hmm. And how do we go and get more of that specific customer? Because we knew what was profitable and what was unprofitable. Yeah. And you know you learn that the hard way, but over time you say, okay, those are the customers we don't want any more of, and those are more customers we want, right? But a service business is it's a tough business to scale because you get a new customer and you have to go, okay, we got to have a new you know front end guy, we have to have a programmer, we have to have an account manager, we have to, and so it's not like a SaaS business where you know you build it and then you know your margins are high, yeah. um, and if you scale that, then you have to go to a new market and have an office and have a team and all that stuff. So it's a tough, it's a grind, no, no pun intended. That's, we that's we appreciate it, no plug intended. That's uh, why I have the word there, because we know. I'll get my 20 bucks later. Right? Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so then looking back, what is something that was like your biggest challenge or something that you would do differently now that you have a few years of being an entrepreneur under your belt? I think my approach today versus what it used to be, it was much more emotional then and now it's all, it's much more data driven. 
So it's sort of that very fact-founded, thought-through approach to making decisions. Instead of me saying, well, this is what I think we should do, it's let's see what the data says, right? And so I think that's a big difference in that, you know, keeps you out of trouble in certain ways. It keeps you in check. It also, I think, takes your team and puts you on a level playing field where if, you know, if you have a good idea and you've been there for two weeks and you have the data to back it up, amen, yeah. let's do it. You know what I mean? Is there so, a, um, going back to what you said about the emotional piece, is there a story about you being in your young 20s that comes to mind about oh, reacting emotionally instead of making a data-driven decision for something? I'm asking a lot. This is um, like a lot of years ago. You know, this, goes, and this also goes in, like, in the regret box, right? So there was a guy that I had working for me. He was a director of technology. And we didn't agree on a lot of stuff. And I fired him. And I fired him, I think, less because of his capabilities and more because I didn't understand what he was doing okay. and bringing to the table so we were you know sort of at odds and so emotionally I was just like well you know I'm the king of the castle here so you got to go it was a bad decision mm -hmm. at the end of the day yeah but a good lesson to learn <laughs> from going going forward yeah. Yeah. all right so Mercury appears was a very successful company right you hit a, a good amount of revenue good amount of revenue we had 25 employees sold it um, in 2005 yeah and one why did you know that was the right time to sell, personally? Um, you know, I would go to the office and I would sit in, I'd go park, you know, park the car, go inside, and I would close my door. And I'd never close my door at the office. I'd always leave it open and people can come in and talk to me and, you know, anything they wanted, anything they needed. And I started to close my door. Mm -hmm. And then somebody asked me, they said, well, you know, you're closing your door a lot. And, I, you know, you don't notice those small little things, right? And then I would go home, and I just wasn't as excited about it. It was, um, you know, a service business at a small level like that is, you know, every month you're like, okay, we got to get that project done. You know, I would go and pick up checks from customers, and I knew the bank manager, and I'd have to go and say, hey, can you deposit this $50,000 check today because I got payroll tonight, you know what I mean? And, you know, so that just over time, um, and then I was, I learned a lot in those five years. And I said, okay, now I can take what I learned and do something that's probably far more exciting for me personally, um, and also maybe more of a value creator than that business was. Okay. So when you started Mercury, how would you have defined success at that point in time? Um, I think it was my success there was driven by the team. Okay. You know, if the team was feeling really good and they were doing great work and everybody was feeling passionate, that was a big success for me, you know, because customers come and go and revenue sort of ebbs and flows. But if you have a really solid team and they're feeling good and that to me was success. And so the time where that was sort of pulled apart and you felt this sort of weird negative energy in the office, mm -hmm. that sucked, okay. you know, but when you were all like, OK, great. You know, I mean, I remember one of my programmers um, going to his wedding and he had a wedding band. And he owned up and played, you know, I play guitar and he played bass and went up and like, Played some Allen Brothers. You know, it was great. That's awesome. You know, yeah, it's fun. So that's success. That's good. How about from a life goals perspective? Like when you sold the company, was there any chance you were like, all right, I gotta do something totally different? Or did you know you were gonna dig back in and start something else? I'm totally unemployable. <laughs> I'm totally unemployable. Um, and I, it took me a little while to realize that, but um, no, it was interesting. Because when I sold that business, um, I got half of the money up front and then I held a note for the other half. And then the guy stopped paying me and accused me of some fraud stuff in the business, which wasn't true. So I had to go, and it, you know, I don't know, I was 20, 29 or so. Um, and so I had to go, and I got into a two and a half year lawsuit. I won, right, and I knew I was right, so that's why, yeah. so that was a big grown up period for me. You know, I'm in Manhattan getting deposed on the 40th floor by, you know, $800 an hour attorneys. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you grow up and you learn a lot real quick. Um, but I also learned a lot about, you know, believing in yourself and saying, you know what, I know I didn't do anything wrong. And, and sometimes that can be a double-edged sword, right? But I fought and fought and fought that, and I won. You know, Congrats. The You're on it. It was great. <laughs> um, so then what did that lead to? And then to? I lost the rest of my hair. And then <laughs> <laughs> so what did that lead to? So then from there, um, it was sort of like the uh, rebound um, relationship where I immediately after that, and actually during that whole process, so I was going through a lawsuit and I started this company called Propellity. And that was a job board 
it was something I was really interested in, in creating a different way, a different type of a job board. Um, and I thought it was a great idea, and I thought it was differentiated, and I thought it was defensible, and all this other stuff. And then the economy dropped out, and... What year is this? It was, uh, it was actually before the economy dropped out, but it was starting to go down, it was like 2007. Okay. Um, and, you know, going through the lawsuit at that time, you know, was a lot. And then I was also going through a divorce at the time, so... And I was getting ordered by the IRS at the same time, so... <laughs> like, it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, right? <laughs> um, you know, so, but, you know, I wouldn't change any of that for the world. That was a big, you know, it's a big part of who I am, right? Um, and so, so I did that, and... You know, I, I still to this day think if we could edit, execute on the vision, that would have been a great company, but I don't think I just really had it within me. Um, and so I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. And then I went and just did consulting. Um, and that was, a, that was a fun process to do consulting for, you know, larger organizations um, around product to market alignment and entrepreneurship and things like that. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to lie. When I was doing Take research on you... Take a breath. The Albany Business Journal had such great articles from you, like from back in 2006. I used to buy them beer too. You owe them, you owe them something. Uh, but it was talking about, was it Pro, Propelity? Propelity, yeah. Propelity. It seems like you got up to a, a good amount of revenue in a pretty short amount of time. Um, we got up to a good amount of users. Users. But there was not revenue. We had a lot of people using it, and but we never sort of got to the revenue part. Um, because we struggled to figure out how do we monetize this. Right, and so that was a big that was a big learning experience for me to say, okay, just because you build it doesn't mean it's awesome and they'll come, right? You know, and that's more maybe on the consumer app side um, than on the sort of B two B side, and so that was a struggle in itself. Um, and I didn't really know a lot about raising money then either, um, and so I was sort of learning all of this as I went. Did you raise for that company? A uh, small bit, okay. yeah, a um, small bit of money, like two hundred thousand. Right. And then looking at, so that's a product business. You had run a services business in the past. Yeah. Other than what you just mentioned about the monetization model, is there anything else that stands out as like an awesome learning experience going from services to a product that you really took forward? I would never go back into services business. Yeah. Never. Even never though, again. Even though you were successful in the services business. Yeah, it's, just, it's a very different business, right? Because... With Echovate now, we can sit back and think about innovation and how we're different in the market and all this other stuff, because we're we're planning, you know, months and years in the future because we're looking at recurring revenue. And recurring revenue, once you get there, right, it's sort of this freedom that allows you to do things that you can't do in a services business, right? So I used to have this uh, this engineer, and he said, you know, we need to sort of stop what we're doing and figure out some processes and procedures and all this other stuff. And he used to say, it's sort of like we're sort of uh, fixing the bike while we're riding it, right? And that always sort of stuck with me because I think in a service business, it's hard to stop. Because when you stop doing stuff to work on your business, you stop servicing the customer. They stop paying you or it's delayed. Well, you still have payroll and rent and expenses and all of this other stuff that you have to do. Um, so for me, a product business and just from a value creation, the multiples on product businesses versus services business are much greater, yeah. right? Recurring revenue businesses are much greater. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it from an exit opportunity, there's a lot more there. Okay. So then going from Propelity, you were doing the consulting thing. Student consulting for a while. Did you start another company after that? Yeah, so then after that, uh, we started, uh, co-founded a company called Checked, and that was a, uh, still, still is around, um, we set out to redefine how reference checking was done. So instead of the antiquated phone-based model, we brought it online, you know, so instead of saying, hey, did Jeremy work for you? What was it like? We automated the whole process. We partnered up with one of the top um, universities in industrial organizational psychology to build a behavioral assessment. And so we were able to make a pre uh, reference check predictive. And we raised about a million dollar seed round for that. And then we acquired a company out of Atlanta in 2009. And that gave us the front end part of the technology around job fit. Um, from there, we sort of stitched together these two platforms and then we were fortunate enough to go out and win customers like Disney and Subway. Subway still uses that um, 30,000, I think 30,000 locations internationally. Um, and then from there, we did a multi-million dollar uh, licensing deal, which acted sort of as a Series A round without getting diluted. Um, and then uh, we just continued to grow, win a lot of customers, and then um, raised a little bit more money, about a $3 million Series A. Um, and during that whole time period, 
is when I looked at, we did all these different data studies for Subway and Disney and whatever else. And it was interesting because I said, you know, the level of sophistication of science and technology that they're using, <coughs> arguably, the small business owner, they need that way more, right? They can't afford a bad hire. Yeah. Um, they need to have a positive impact on their revenue, all these different things. And so I was much more excited about that. And so then I left, um, I left checked, uh, I don't even know when that was, three and a half or four years ago, um, and then started Echo 8. Okay. We're going to get to Echo in one minute. I just want, I want to go. I'll take a beer break. Take a beer break. <laughs> I want to focus on one thing that you said um, about checked. And that's, it was the first time you raised significant venture capital. You raised a million bucks off the bat. Yeah. There are a number of people in this room who are looking to start their first company, are looking to raise a seed round, looking to raise an A round, get going. What did you learn from that experience? Um, you know, I think you need to be really deliberate in who you take money from. I think when you take money for your startup, that is a massive obligation. And it's an obligation, the way that I look at it, that's somebody's hard-earned money that they work for, that they're giving you, right? And, you know, again, when you look at a seed round and angel rounds, right? And so you can't take that lightly. And I know that a lot of people look to raise money, and that's sort of like the goal, but that's not. Raising money is just a tool to execute on your vision, mm -hmm. right? And so you need to have that vision, that plan. How are you going to monetize it? How are you truly different in the market? Um, I hear so many people that go, well, there's no competitors like us. It's bullshit. Right? There's a lot of people out there. So how are you different? How are you going to do something that's really compelling that, that's going to create a lot of value for them? Um, so what I learned, to answer your question, what I learned there is we really took money from really anybody that was willing to write us a check. Um, and, and that's a good business, and I believe in that business. Um, however, what we didn't think about is how do those investors, once that money has been deployed, into the company, how do we go back to them and say, hey, I've got a question for you, mm -hmm. right? Um, those are interesting. Somewhere around here is Joe Hanna, there he is. So Joe is an investor in Echovate, and there's times where I'll call up Joe and say, hey Joe, you know, I, got, I wanna run this by, and what do you think about this, and whatever else. That's what you want. You want somebody that you can go to and say, you know, I can always call Joe and I can ask questions. Joe has that experience, and he's also in his own startup right now, so he's experiencing so at Check, we didn't do that, right? And so we never were able to really go back and ask those questions of those people. Okay. Um, I think that's really important to get to, really important. And it's equally important to have that sort of investment thesis to be able to say no to people. That's the hardest thing is to say, no, I, I want that money right now, but I'm going to say no because it's not in the long-term vision of the company. That's a hard thing to do. This. So then going into Equivate, did you know you were going to have to raise money to get this off the ground? Or did you think you could bootstrap it at a point in time? Um, no, I think that what we're doing I think is really interesting. Um, and there's a big, really big market opportunity. And I think what's interesting about a SaaS business is essentially you're financing your customers. Right? You're not asking them to pay in advance for a year. So that venture capital or that angel or that seed becomes a way that you can actually finance your customers. And that's why you see these companies that are raising 50 or 100 or $200 million rounds, they're doing that not so much to put into innovation because they understand what's our customer acquisition cost, what's our lifetime value, and we know it's just math. We've got to do this to yeah. get there. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that you can run a uh, really scalable SaaS business without raising some form of venture, okay. right? so some, some sort of, some form of investment anyways. Okay. So it was in your mind right off the bat. Yeah. Is there anything you did specifically when you started Equivate to position it in a way that would be attractive for investors? Um, I built a board of advisors out of the gate. I think that was important. Um, and that sort of gave the credibility in some ways, but then they were also investors as well. Um, so I think- Talk about what you just said, <clears throat> that's really important. So how did that, how did you, make that leap from advisor to investor? Was it a requirement? Is it something that they brought no, up, you brought up? No, it wasn't a requirement um, because I was more interested in, again, the value and experience they brought to the table. So some of my advisors, investors, some of my advisors early on, I reached out to this guy, uh, Jesse Harriott. He's the chief analytics officer at Constant Contact. How'd you know him before I could I didn't, I just reached out to him. Um, like that. Just like that. Just send him a, Will you be my, my wife was like, you're yeah. crazy. I'm like, nope. You have to give them the chance to say no, yeah. right? At the end of the day, you know, 
if you don't ask, they, you, you got to do it, right? Wow. And so, so cold LinkedIn message. But it wasn't like you know, hey, I'm trying to sell you. It was like, listen, I'm interested in you because of these qualities, characteristics. I want to tell you what I'm doing, and I want you to come on as an advisory uh, board of advisor. And but it's also not pro bono stuff. I give these guys equity. Okay. So they have real skin in the game of making this successful. So so I did that. Um, I drove out to Boston, met with Jesse. Um, had a couple conversations with him, and then he's like, I love it, I'm in. Um, so we spent some time together, and then he introduced me to a guy that he used to work for, who was the former president of Monster.com, uh, Steve Porgazelski. And he said, hey, you know, I'm doing this stuff with Matt in this cool company, you should take a look. And Steve said, great, I'll invest. I think it's really interesting. And then I said, would you be, you know, board advisor? And he said, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> so um, so it was those sort of two things. And then I reached out to um, Dan Walker, who's the former uh, chief talent officer of Apple. Um, again, just through LinkedIn. I mean, I sent like maybe 50 emails, right? A lot of I didn't hear back. But the ones I heard back, I was like, holy shit, this is awesome, right? And, um, and then I talked to Dan a bunch. And uh, he's a very interesting character. Um, but he... Uh, He's like, I really love what you're doing. I think it's really interesting. So, got to ask. Got to do it. Got to ask. Um, so this is really early on in the company. Where, I mean, help us understand what you're presenting to these people. Are you showing them a prototype? Are you showing them an idea on a napkin? Are you just talking to them? Like, I'm just talking to them. You're Usually. saying, this is where I'm headed. Are yeah. you in or you're out? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that I have, um, I have an interesting story as it pertains to Echo 8 because I've done this for six years for Fortune 500 global brands. Right, so I sold Disney, and I worked with their, you know, part of their executive team to get this done. And same thing with Subway. Um, you know, so I think through that, people they looked and they said, okay, Matt's not totally full of shit, and there's something interesting here. It's released now. So going forward, let's say the next year, 2015, what do you want to accomplish out of the beta? Is it a controlled rollout? Are you only inviting certain people? We're only inviting certain people right now because we want to learn. Okay. We're in total learning phase right now. So we have a lot of assumptions, and we want to test those assumptions. Okay. And so we so we have we have customers that are in there that are using it, doing the whole thing, and we're trying to learn from that data um, because there's inevitably there's a nugget of truth in there that we haven't thought of, and we're only going to hear that from our customers. Yeah. At the end of the day. I think one of the hardest parts of starting an early stage company. Have all this data in front of you, and it's really difficult to pick the two or three factors you want to focus and emphasize and, and really strive to hit. So, in your business, what are those factors, and how, do you, how did you decide those were the right ones? In sense of product or business in general? What do you try? What would make successful data? Is it revenue? Is it customers? Is it retention? I would I would go back and say it's feedback, right? And it's somebody who continues to use the product. Um, so revenue to me is a very uh, can be an artificial um, identifier of success, right? So just because somebody pays you, it doesn't mean you actually have a great product and you can scale it. It's certainly a nice indicator, right? But if you can get in front of the right people and they're giving you good feedback at this stage, and they're giving you good feedback, and then they're saying, you know, what, I'm going to introduce you to my network. That to me is more important at this stage because I'd rather have somebody that has a network that they're going to say, I'm going to tell all my friends they should be using this because if they endorse it. That's more than their 250 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month or whatever else. Um, so at this stage, we want to learn a lot. We want to sanity check some beliefs that we have, and we want them to be cheerleaders. You know, we're having a conversation now about how do we create this sort of viral effect within our product, where they say, "Hey, I'm going to have a coupon code, and I can invite three people or five people, and here it is, and you guys go use it, and they're going to be proud of it." Yeah. Well, you're the data man and everything you just said is very qualitative. So is, there, is there any like quantitative things you're looking at in the beta that will help you measure success? Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be how many candidates come through, um, how do we, we look at the performance of those candidates. Uh, so without getting too geeky into it, but we want to know if we say that somebody's an 85 and you should hire them, and you hire them. Are they doing well? Are they a top performer? Did they leave? Right. We want to make sure we believe all our data science is you know tried and true and all that stuff, and that's you know coming from the PhDs. But we want to also sanity check it with our own system. 
and we want to have sort of this feedback. So that element of it is very important to us. I mean, that's why we're also doing a control sort of rollout. We don't want to do like the whole Obamacare and it doesn't work. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, Sorry. <laughs> So then, if I were to ask you this question at the beginning, where did you define success for your first company? And you said it was all about having a work environment that you were proud and happy and excited to go to every day. How would you define success for this new company? I think it's all around team. Um, what I miss most about my first company is not necessarily, I mean, I miss the customers and, and in some way because I was friends with them, but I miss the team. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, you know, money comes and money goes and you can, you know, have a headline and all this other stuff. But it's like the people that, you know, you get to know them and you get to know their families and you're building something really cool. And I mean, to me, that's just fun, you know? I mean, and I think you look around, you look at Boomtown, you look at Spark, it's sort of like this, uh, you get a company and it's sort of like a street gang, you know what I mean, in some ways, and that's fun, you know? Um, and that's sort of what you want to create. Um, now, hopefully along the way, you do really well, and you do well by your clients, and you empower them in some way, and you all make some money, you know, at the same time. Yeah, man. That's it. I hope. That's a good. That's a good recipe for success. All right. Um, any final words about Echovate? No. No. It's awesome. We're covered. <laughs> I will say that. Um, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge? Which one? Which challenge stands out the most? I think that, um, I was just saying this earlier in the conference room, I think one of our big, biggest challenges, which is very hard to plan for, is I think this thing is going to be a massive home run. Um, and I say that sort of very objectively. I think it's going to be a massive home run. And I think our biggest challenge is going to be able to manage that. Right? Being able to manage, we have all these customers coming in, we have to manage the technology, and it's just, you know, anytime you have a high growth business, it's a big challenge. Um, and I feel really confident that that's where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been yet in a really high growth business, so I don't have that experience. Um, but I think that's why you have great investors, advisors, and surround yourself with smart people who can say, hey, you know, how do we do this, or what about this, and, and different things like that. Um, so. That's probably my bigger concern because it's hard to account for that. Um, you know, you don't really know what that looks like. Yeah. What do you think that means in terms of growing the business in Charleston? So in a year, how many employees do you, would you want? Like, I, I hope as few as possible. As few as possible. Right? <laughs> yeah, and I say that because, you know, if you can do a lot of great work with as few as people possible, then, you know, you're being lean, you're being profitable, you're being fiscally responsible. Um, you know, I would like to raise as little money as possible. Um, just, you know, for the obvious reasons where, you know, then the company retains more equity, right? Um, but not at the cost of the business, of course. Um, so I think a year from now, it's sort of a tough conversation to sort of figure out where you're going to be. Um, you can try to drive it by revenue, but um, we're certainly interested in hiring in Charleston. Um, and building the business in Charleston, just like some of the other great companies that are here. Um, that's what we're trying to do. We're not. We don't want to, you know, outsource stuff to you know overseas. We don't want to do any of that. And that's, I'm sure half of the people here probably know Tim. And that's one thing that excited me about Tim is he's all about people, right? It's people first, and that's how you build a great company. Um, so I think in doing that, and if you have a great product and all this other stuff, then then it's sort of a home run at the end of the day. Yeah. I agree more. One more topic, then we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, but what you're talking about, I think, is a good transition. So you're talking about hiring from Charleston and how much how dedicated you are to this market. I don't know what the specific parallel is to where you grew your last business, but I imagine it might be similar. It's the mid-market city that has... A, it's just way better. Dude. Is it? It's way better. <laughs> All right, so tell us what, what the startup ecosystem was like where you're from and what we see here and, and what we're doing really well here. There wasn't really a startup ecosystem. It was a bunch of people that owned companies. Um, and that, to me, is a very big distinction between business owners and startup ecosystems, right? Things like this, things like the Charleston Digital Corridor, and I feel like we're just getting started here, right? Um, there wasn't this sort of groundswell, and that was one of the reasons where um, I remember coming back and I would mentor at Techstars, and I would talk to my wife about it. She's like, I could just like, you're glowing. You're excited, you know? 
that's you need to be sort of doing those things. And so I would drive to Boston, drive to New York, and do those things. It was great. But you want to do that in your own backyard, right? You want to be a, a contributor locally to something. So you look back in 20 years and go, that's awesome. In some way, I changed the temperature of you know the startup ecosystem. Um, and so when when I started Echovate, I thought I can do this anywhere I want on the planet. And where is it going to make sense? And so I was excited about the how I guess Charleston was really coming together to say, you know, let's be something really great, but let's maintain the integrity mm -hmm. of what Charleston is. And so I've got two young boys and I think, you know, yeah, it's also nice sometimes to buzz over to Sullivan's or you know, or go to the aquarium or do these different things. And so I look at that as a massive asset when you're building a company, right? When you look at people, um, you know, Tim, I keep on picking on you, but, um, you know, Tim had some amazing job offers around the country. And his blog post that he just wrote, he's like, but Charleston is, it's it. This is where I want to be. And, you know, I think there's something very deliberate about that, something very meaningful that sort of permeates the culture of the company. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you. Daniel, do you have any questions to no, add? No, I think, I think you covered it well. All right, well, let's open it up. Uh, questions in the audience. Do you have a question? <laughs> yes. Hey, Matt. Uh, my name's Rob. Thanks so much for sharing your story. It's really interesting. Uh, so, Seth, you've been on both sides of uh, giving advice as a tech startup mentor and receiving advice and building your board of advisors. Uh, can you talk about, like, walk us through what a typical board of advisors meeting was like? Um, and my, so it's kind of a two-part question. So kind of describe the format of a board of advisors meeting. And second, generally, how do you implement their their advice? You know, it's a lot of different feedback and um, both. Yeah, you know, so it's a lot of feedback. So just talk a little bit about how you personally, in a business context, implement their process improvements or suggestions. Um, I'm uh, right now a one-man team, and just you know, getting feedback is like almost like processing it and figuring out. How to reflect it back into the business and the core you know, processes and all that. So if you could just address those. Things. So I don't do um, sort of formal board of advisory meetings, right, right. Um, and I didn't do that for. I did one early on, and it was sort of this weird, awkward experience of me asking for advice. And Steve had said to me, "He's like, what do you think? What's your plans? What's your?" I'm going. Well, I have all these ideas, right? And so I said, why don't we shift it differently? And we can always sort of go back, but I just want to be able to call people and say, hey, I, I need to, I got a call tomorrow at noon with, with one of my guys because I want to sanity check a couple of things, whatever. So I think in a startup, when if you're thinking about something, so we were thinking about this whole freemium model um, for Activate. And thought, you know, some days I thought it was, you know, the best thing ever, and some days I thought it was the stupidest idea, right? And so I formulated my thoughts and did all my different research whenever else. And I came out with a position, and I said, here's what I think, right? What do you think? And they said, well, I think you're wrong because of this, or you're right, but think about this. Um, so I use my board of advisors in maybe a different capacity. Um, I don't want to sit down and have meetings and sort of go through things and do it monthly or quarterly, because if I got to call you tomorrow because I need something, I have your cell phone and my phone, I'm going to call you up and say, hey, I got a question, I'm going to shoot you an email. Um, and that just... For me personally, my style, I wanted to be nimble in doing that. Um, you know, to wait two weeks in a startup when you're at this stage just feels like it feels forever for me, right? Um, but what I do is every month I send out an update email to all my investors and all my advisors and say, here's where we're at, here's what's going on, here's what I need help with, and all this different stuff. Um, you know, and then I try to engage them in different ways. So to my advisors, uh, Steve and Jesse, we're doing a panel on big data at Dig South, and they're coming down for that. So around that, we also are going to do a, you know, an afternoon session and really get into it. Um, I was supposed to go up there during one of the five or six massive Boston snowstorms, and it got canceled twice, so I'm just doing it on the phone. So, um, but I, I think you just need to do it with what works for you, like what makes sense, and it doesn't need to be formal. But I would say. Formulate your opinion on what you think because if you're the CEO of the company and you go there sort of directionless um, at that level, they're going to kick you in the ass. So, hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, definitely does. And then, so, when you do get feedback or you bounce an idea off of them, kind of how do you reintegrate that into either building the data or you know just kind of 
thinking through processes it, or it just becomes like one more um, becomes one more piece of information in your decision process. Mm -hmm. Just because they say something and say, well, if I were you, I would do it this way. They may not have all of the context, right? Or maybe I didn't explain it the right way, or things like that. So, um, you know, one of the one of the verticals we were looking to go after, or we're looking to go after, is emerging growth tech companies. Um, well, I talked to my advisors, and everybody says, yeah, that sounds great, right? That's that's a sexy vertical to go after. Well, as it turns out, we're getting a ton of interest from real estate companies and auto dealerships, right? It's much less sexy. Your advisors are going, yeah, okay, but I'm going. But they're knocking on our door. They're asking us for our product. They want to pay us. That's pretty cool, right? So there's something to be argued about that as well. Um, so. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? I have a quick one. Now, I don't know how much of your product is proprietary right now, but um, I'm just curious in terms of like a data set. I, I think um, like thinking workforce data and locationally, there is just so much that's qualitative in that. Uh, is there a certain subset of the workforce that your product is going to target? So yeah, we are focused on, um, our, our big thing, and this goes back to, this goes back to Mercury, and it goes back to a lot of family, friends that have their own small businesses. We're really hyper-focused on how do we have a positive improvement on their revenue, right, and on their performance as a company. And so in order to do that, we believe that um, that sort of customer-facing position, right? Sales, uh, account management, things like that. So we're not trying to crack the code on how do you hire a better engineer or where are the skills gap. That's, you can talk to Joe about that, right? Um, so we're not trying to go down that road. And I think that um, we're trying to be highly specialized in helping to predict future performance and ultimately connect that to revenue. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it does, and I think of like the data, I guess that's uh, the guys at NC State, the data scientists, do they have these data sets that they... Yeah, so that's based on the five-factor model, which is a behavioral assessment um, that's been out there, or I should say uh, uh, behavioral psychology, um, that's been out there for a long time. It's sort of publicly available, you can Google it and look it up. There's also ONET, um, which you can get a lot of really interesting data, that's uh, a government site. And so between all of that, then we went and spent the better part of nine months writing our own assessment. So we wrote our own questions, our own competencies that relate to sales, in those positions, and what are the scales in those, and all of this other stuff. So it is proprietary, um, but it's based on the five-factor model, which has been around. But as I was saying uh, earlier, our longer-term goal is to eventually leverage the bigger data set around both publicly available sources, and then internal customer and candidate sources to really move the needle on what predictive is. Thanks. Are you worried about data security? I'm not. Tim is. Very. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you're always worried about that, right? Because I think that if you're really trying to do something, if you're running a good business, you care about your customers, right? I mean, you really care. It's not like BS on your website. You actually really care about them, and you care about your candidates. And the last thing you want to do is have somebody have anything that happens to them, right? Stealing data, anything like that, um, you know, or just posting just nasty stuff out there. Um, so yeah, that's always, but that's an, always an ongoing concern. Um, you know, we're doing things about uh, a conversation that Tim and I had about, you know, uploading documents. Well, that that adds a whole security level. Mm -hmm that we say, is that worth the value that our customers are going to get? We don't think so. We think there's other ways to get to that data without opening ourselves up to a security issue like that. Um, now we may have to do that in the future, but right now, let's try to keep it as tight as we can. Absolutely. Following up on the uh, data set question, you know, when you talk about the cooperative database and really kind of taking the predictive analytics to the next level, one of the typical challenge you find with a, with a cooperative data set is just that, no pun intended, bootstrap problem of getting enough people willing to participate that you can try to create that insight. Yeah. How are you looking at that challenge? Is it just that what you're able to get from the public sources and do with that is so valuable that it'll kind of create that, that kind of gravity? That yeah, so I mean the big thing is really honestly getting the performance feedback from the existing customer, right? Um, we said that candidate was going to be a good fit. You hired them, were they a good fit? Were they a rock star? 
high performer, minimum performer, low performer. Um, so what we're doing is we're building um, what we're calling the community, right? And the community is a way that you go in and you add this information. And over time, your actual account through machine learning gets smarter. Mm -hmm. So we know over time, you should be hiring this sort of salesperson with these attributes versus where you started, right? So if you don't give data into the community, you're not getting it back. Um, so it's sort of this give and take sort of thing. Um, you look at, you know, let's say we have um, a real estate company that has a national footprint or an auto dealership that has a national footprint. You can start to learn from the Honda dealership in San Francisco and the Honda dealership in Charleston, right? And over time, we can look at that data. And so they have to give it back. And that's, so the community is the idea of if you don't give it, you don't, you don't get access to it. See if it works. I have a question about product market fit, and this might be kind of like a chicken and the egg type of question, but you know, you talked about how you were looking at one customer archetype and then you kind of shifted to the others based upon feedback. How do you use customer discovery to guide your feature set in your product? Do you start with the customer archetype and align feature set to that archetype, or do you go out and just find out who's interested in this and then kind of reverse engineer your customer archetype? Um, that's a good question. No, we actually look at, <coughs> we start with emerging growth tech, and I still believe that's a really big opportunity. Um, there's a big sort of a hole there. Um, but then we start to build like, what, what does that look like? Who are those people? Um, you know, does it make sense? How much is it going to cost to get some early traction? I mean, that's just a reality of a startup, right? You got to think about those things. And so we had a bunch of assumptions. And then I went and did demos and talked to a bunch of people in that category. And like, this sounds great. We're interested. And so it was a little bit of, we did our data research. And then we talked to them. And we did some more research and talked to them some more. And, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's one specific thing, but just, just being really thoughtful and data-driven um, around the whole thing, you know. It's, uh, I think to go out and just go after a, a market or an opportunity because you think it's good, you got to stand and check it, you got to show it to people. And you may say, that's a great market, but it, it's too early for us to hit that, right? We can get better penetration over here, get some early wins under our belt, get some data, learn some stuff, and then that's going to be our second vertical we go after. Um, I don't know if that answers, answers your question. Guy with the hat. <laughs> so, uh, so Jeremy mentioned that earlier, and uh, I've noticed you're a prolific writer. You write a lot of blogs. I always read what you write. Um, is that strategic to your growth and branding, or do you just like to write? I just like to do it. You know, um, it's the same thing with this. Like, this is not, sure, this is a great commercial for Echovate in some way, right? But nobody here really is our target customer. It's, you know, we live here, and I hope that my boys graduate here and walk across stage here. Like, this is where we live, and I'm excited and passionate about startups. Um, you know, I just think it's awesome. So, like, I think writing stuff is fun. It's, um, you know, I've got one that's sort of percolating about how your spouse is a big influencer and important on the success of companies, right? And it's just, but it's something that I've sort of been through and thought about and all this other stuff. and. You know, that's, it's not self-serving or anything like that with Echovate, it's just, if I can put it out there, it's great. You know what I mean? It's just fun stuff to do, you know? I think it's the same thing that Rich does with his podcast. It's like, he gets a bunch, bunch of people together, um, even though that we should have been the number one <laughs> podcast, whatever. Um, inside joke. Um, you know, like, I just think those are all good things to do for the community. You know, just connect and share information, and I think we're really open then we're all going to learn from one another, and then we're going to just get to the next sort of level in the startup ecosystem, you know? So, 